happy International Women's Day Yay. and uh, happy anniversary, Rough Trade. Uh, yeah, you can hear me. Good evening, everyone. Um, delighted to be here t tonight celebrating Rough Trade, celebrating International Women's Day and celebrating the raincoats. And we have with us the collaborator and manager, Shirley McLaughlin, Anna oh, de Silva. Sorry? Oh, 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 oh Lachlan, oh, sorry. Uh, Very important. I'll leave now. <laughs> I'll go home. Very um, important. <laughs> okay. Anna de Silva and Gina Birch. Um, I wanted to start by asking them who they were and what they were looking for before they found each other. So perhaps, Anna, would you like to say something first okay. about that? I was going to say we were nothing, but we were something. <laughs> um, it, in my case, I came from Portugal, which was a, a fascist country until very much up to the time when I came. And uh, I felt very drowned uh, with it. I didn't know what I was looking for, but I, I knew what, what I didn't want at the time. And it was, uh, uh, there was no freedom in arts or in, in uh, uh, political expression, uh, sexuality, re religion, nothing. It was all very, uh, how do you say? Uh, suppressed? Suppressed, yes, yeah. you felt suppressed. So when I, I came to England for a, a month one time, and I really liked it, and I felt a sense of freedom when I was here. And um, so, but I went back, finished my, my studies, and then I decided to come to, to England. And it was uh, an amazing thing, because I came at the end of 74, and I just started looking at things and listening to things and just developing thought, I suppose. And I decided to w go to art college, and then when punk started, it was uh, an amazing thing for me because I had never been in any movement. I had seen things happen before, but um, I was actually part of it. I was going to, to the Roxy and to places like that. So that's my experience. And obviously at art college, I met Jean, everybody knows. And uh, uh, then we started the band. So when we started the band, I don't, I don't know if we actually had some big ideas of what we were looking for, but we were really in the punk, um, in the punk atmosphere where we felt that all the doors were open, mm -hmm. and it was just a question of us finding our own ways, and we were all different, and and we brought those differences in, and we just developed together, really. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't like we didn't have a plan. It's just everything just happen very organically. It's as if the tensions between the two of you kind of held you together rather than a plan. Gina, tell us about where you came from. And me well, you didn't you have Anna. to be in Portugal in a fascist <laughs> country to feel oppressed or suppressed. I came from Nottingham, from a uh, um, kind of lower middle class mm -hmm. family that uh, I was dying to kind of escape. I'm sure many of you know that feeling where you're just like, you just want to get out, you just want to get out. And I went to art school and um, I discovered, um, I discovered sculpture wasn't making a Michelangelo sculpture. It could be, it could be an idea. I discovered conceptual art and land art and all these things that just completely blew my mind. And Nottingham was quite a funky place to go to art school. Um, and, but for some reason, I ended up uh, coming to London to do my uh, fine art degree. And when I got there, the college, Hornsey, was, wasn't quite what I was expecting. There were people painting horses and uh, doing things that I just didn't... I mean, I know Mark Wallinger did that later, but at the time, it wasn't a groovy thing to do. But what was happening and what I'd seen on my, uh, on my travels uh, was I peculiarly chanced upon the Sex Pistols' first gig. And when I got to London, I moved into a street full of uh, extraordinary people. It was in a squat, and uh, someone from my art school had invited me to this place. And it was so exciting. And I lived next door but one to... Um, um, 
the sister of Palmolive, who was in the slits. And when I saw the slits play, I mean, uh, the thing is, when you're a girl growing up, I went to an all-girls school, girls... Um, seem to have opportunities, but uh, as as you get through, uh, uh, when I went to art school, I realised that actually, boys were getting a better deal than we were. We weren't quite getting the same, the same, uh, uh, I don't know, the same freedoms. They'd kind of. I remember in the canteen, the boys would suddenly kind of pull out some uh, really nasty pornographic magazines to like embarrass us and things like that. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and um, um, and things you just began to realize that actually the world was a pretty kind of damn unequal place. And so we, w when I saw the Slits play and w when uh, Anna and I started going to uh, see bands play and there were women in the bands, uh, this was quite, uh, um, quite a revelation. And uh, for me, completely liberating seeing the Slits. And uh, so... As soon as I saw them play, I kind of knew what I was looking for. I knew that that liberation was something that um, was amazing, really special. And uh, if, if, if um, we could be anywhere near that, that's what I was looking for. Hmm. So this is a time where there's no internet, there's no mobile phone. You prob probably didn't even have a landline in the house. You would go to the phone box. Yet yes. people met each other and discovered like minds and form bands. Shirley, tell us how you came on the scene. Well, like these two, um, I'd been at art school as well and came down to London. And um, I don't know, I just felt pretty lost really. And then, and then one day um, I saw um, a picture of Patti Smith and I didn't really know her music at all and it was advertising this gig at the Roundhouse. And, um, I just knew I had to go there. And that, for me, was a real life-changing moment. It was like there was before and there was suddenly after. Um, I remember sort of rushing in there and, and standing at the front, and she just came onto the stage, punching the air, dressed like a boxer, and spat on the floor. And, I mean, it sounds really really pathetic now but back then in 1976 it was just like what you know and um and then you know she just went into Jesus died for somebody's sins but not mine and that was like the moment <laughs> you know and I know that that night there were many, many people in that audience whose whose lives changed you know and mm -hmm. people decided to form bands and so on um, anyway, I went, I went, <laughs> I f somebody told me that there was this shop called Rough Trade on Kensington Park uh, Road and um, that they had some bootlegs of Patti Smith in there. So I went down there, started speaking to this guy called Steve and Steve was a really brilliant guy and um, he said that he was going to get me this bootleg and... Um, a few, a few months later, he managed to do that. And in between, I managed to take a picture of Patti Smith, which is in the journal, um, if you have a look at it. And um, I took this picture in to give to Steve to say thank you. And um, he, he said, oh, we can sell these pictures, you know. So, so that's how our, my sort of relationship with Rough Trade began. And I just, for me, it was like the only place to be. Like, on Saturday, the place was absolutely rammed with people, artists, musicians, writers. There were piles of fanzines and so on. And people were just, you know, exchanging information. And it was like everybody had permission to form a band. And for me, it was just... it just That whole period just sort of changed my life completely. Um, later on, like these two, I was at the same gig at, uh, at Harlesden, the Slit's first gig... And again, that had an uh, amazing effect on me. And um, yeah, I'd probably go on a bit too long if I carry on on <laughs> this vein, but <laughs> no, eventually <yeah. laughs> um, I got to know these two and uh, used to go and sit in on their rehearsals sometimes on Saturdays and then we'd go down to the Rough Trade shop. And, you know, for me, the raincoats had that a, a similar effect. I mean, it was like the tenderest... 
harshest, most powerful thing that I'd heard, and it just totally made me want to work with them, you know. And here I am, still working with them, you know. But, yeah, so that whole kind of... Um, 1976, 78 period, that's, that's when all that happened for me, yeah. And I, I don't think it's necessarily the case that it would now seem tame. I don't think things become necessarily more radical or transgressive or powerful as, as we go on. In some ways, they become much more conventional. Um, but it was an extraordinary time. And that thing of you could only exchange information by turning up, by being there. So people did gather in rough trade. They gathered in record shops all over the country. You just turned up and you hung around. And you also had permission. You had permission to do that. And you had permission to form a band, whether or not you'd played an instrument. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the kind of music you were making. It was a time when people defined themselves a lot by what they weren't and what they were against, rather than what they wanted to be. Is that how you two started finding what the sh sort of shape your music was going to take? That's what I was saying before. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was <laughs> what I was uh, saying before. I didn't really know what I wanted to be in yeah. a way. I just and 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 the whole thing of of being at art college and the punk thing and rough trade and seeing just feeling that, that there was. Uh, um, endless possibilities and that you could be who you wanted to be mm. and everybody and there was so many different people and that expressed in, in different ways and uh, f for me that was really it was like uh, I was born or something yeah. Um, yeah. and and punk in a way had the sort of young quality to it a sort of naive quality at the yeah. same time to start with and very open, and and that suited me in my yeah. being born. <laughs> I mean, one <laughs> of the thing. naiveties of punk was that it thought it came from nowhere, and of course it didn't come no, from nowhere. It was drawing on nowhere. rock and roll and everything else, and post punk, you know, lots yeah. of the dub and jazz coming in. Um, so I wanted to ask you about musical influence, and particularly the musical influences, which were not those that necessarily you felt a musical affinity with, not those that sounded like you, you know. What sort of unlikely musical influences were there? Well, I think we had a lot of um, musical influences. Uh, punk was, uh, uh, in a way, when it first started, there was a, a whole lot of prejudices. And when you're kind of 19, 20, you think you know, you know it all, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. and. Uh, I, I, you know, I remember thinking who was punk and who wasn't punk and the Stranglers definitely weren't punk, although in <laughs> punk history the Stranglers are <laughs> punk, you know. But for me, the Stranglers were never punk, you know. How dare they be punk? Um, so there was a lot of prejudices <laughs> and stuff. Um, um, I, the, the question is, <laughs> um, what influences um, w were unusual? I, I, I mean, the, the, the thing is that there, there were lots of influences that um, were usual, and uh, uh, I'm going to be like a politician here and just answer whatever question I think I want to answer. But <laughs> definitely... Uh, <laughs> right. def definitely um, reggae and, and early punk. And, and you know, the, the bands like The Slits and ATV and Scritti Politti and Swell Maps and all those early, well, for me, uh, early bands... They had a very profound uh, influence, but also um, my my neighbour, who happened to be uh, Paloma's brother-in-law, he he was very very interested in world music, and so he played lot played me lots of interesting music from different parts of the world and jazz and um, you know um, oh, Pharaoh Sanders and all sorts of interesting people. And and for me as a bass player, I was really interested in the way that the bass was constructed in a lot of different music. And so I would I would uh, look at those um, melodies and rhythms and lines and things and, and, and kind of, um, I don't know, learn to play some of them and use some of their influences. But I, I remember there was a bit of Michael Nyman where he was... He was using something. Um, it was it was systems music. Anna and I were both a little bit uh, um, 
knocked sideways by systems music. We, we couldn't quite get it because within our art school, systems music was embraced as a form of art, whereas what we were doing was completely not embraced as a form of art. Um, but Michael Nyman was doing something with numbers, and I remember uh, bringing in this idea that uh, when we were doing... Um, we said, go away, and go away. Um, it was a little bit later. Uh, that, uh, um, I wanted to do this thing where we went, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and it was like, it drove us insane, but it was really kind of quite fun to yeah. do, to work it out. And uh, so things like that, sometimes we would set ourselves, I mean, we've, we've always tried to... Um, push ourselves beyond, slightly beyond our capabilities, I think. And, and, and that's, in a way, what keeps it interesting for us and hopefully for the, for the people who uh, still hang on, hang on to our um, occasional mistakes, you know, that we, 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 we do try to push what we do into, into areas that um, keep us alert and interested. Does uh, that answer your question? No, it maybe? does. It does. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about musical tension. Earlier on... I quoted an old interview um, to them in which um, Gina said we broke up ef after every album and Anna, no sorry, Anna said we broke up after every album, Gina we said yeah. we broke up after every gig and as soon as I quoted it back to them, Gina said I was joking, Anna said I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so talk a bit about that. <laughs> Well, it's, it's very difficult to have uh, three, four or five people uh, being very creative and very quite sure of what they want because it's very difficult that that coincides with, uh, with the other members. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we in, within our band, there was different, not just the things that we liked, but also who we were, the, the, our character, our personalities and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And um, so those ten, I don't think the tensions really, personally I don't think that the, the tensions are the interesting thing about the band. Mm -hmm. I think the differences are yeah. what we brought differently uh, from each other. So we brought more, uh, more things that way. Mm -hmm. But um, the tensions, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think necessarily it's, yeah. uh, um, it's, when we end up agreeing with something that then we have something to show, isn't it? Yeah. Sort of, uh, I do a bit, Gina does a bit, and then it creates something that is maybe unusual because we're so different from each other, and, and, um, and that's what it, we, what it does. Like with Sonic Youth, the two guitarists yeah. were so different, and, and that's something that made it really interesting. Um, and, and you've also got this integral third figure, Shirley. Yes. Um, and can you say a bit about your role in, in this, um, in the musical differences? Dare I? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I agree with what Anna said. I, th I think that that diversity, that difference, is something that's really, really special. Uh, you know, and obviously there are, there are times when life is difficult things are difficult decisions have to have to be made and i suppose you know m a lot of my function with the band uh, was to be a sort of interface between the band and the world and and so on and you know you've got deadlines you've got stuff that you have to do and so on so i suppose yeah from time to time i had to sort of smooth things make sure that things happen and you know mm -hmm that whole thing about, you know, we really tried, and I think this was really, really important to all of us, I mean, certainly was to me, to, to, make, to make decisions together that, y you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just, you know, signing to any old label or anything. It had to be something that was really, you know, like rough trade. I mean, rough trade, that relationship, it was like a partnership. I mean, we never had any disagreements about artistic or creative um, disagreements. You know, uh, Jeff would say, you know, he really wanted to make a single or an album or, or whatever. We'd take it to Jeff and, you know, our, our 
all our sort of creative um, decisions were our own, you know. And there was this, this other layer, which was um, the ethos at the time of democracy and bands being democratic, and many bands founded on this um, desire to be democratic. Were you a democratic band? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. otherwise we wouldn't <laughs> fight. In unison. Yeah, we were a democratic <laughs> band, and I, I mean, I always think... Uh, Anna was very strong in that, because when we first started, I... I w didn't really have the confidence to think that I could write or sing, and, and Anna really encouraged us all to, uh, to contribute in that way, to write and to perform and to sing. And uh, she probably regretted it after a while. <laughs> no, she didn't. <laughs> jokes, <laughs> jokes. Um, <laughs> um, but, but so we operated as a, as a democracy, and, and that did lead to a lot of kind of, uh, wow! <laughs> we, we fought, um, um, and uh, we fought some more, uh, um, but it... Uh, we fight, and we fight some more. We <laughs> do indeed. We always fight. Uh, the thing is that, um, you know, sometimes you realize that you've made a bad decision, and sometimes you realize the other person's right, and I've got this T-shirt which says, I'm not always right, and it stinks, <laughs> and I stick by that. <laughs> Um, so in so it didn't sorry, make any sorry. sense not to do it that way. That's yeah. what I felt as well. Yeah. yeah. So it was a kind of um, democracy um, of fruitful conflict, as such, or democracy as not conflict, not conflict. No, no I just think I think uh, just retaining that sense of differences rather than creating a homogenized sort of yeah. compromise. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, because it's, it's true. Your music has that spaciousness, so it seems to accommodate these very different things within yeah. it, yeah. Um, which is part of what makes it so interesting. Um, now, famously, Kurt Cobain came to Rough Trade in '92, was it, looking for your first album, yeah. and was sent round the corner to meet you. Yes. Yeah, and. Yeah, he went to Rough Trade and Judy, uh, who was one of the directors of the, sh of the shop at the time, um, yeah, he asked for the record and uh, they, w they weren't available at the time. So she said, well, they're not available, but Anna, who is my friend and neighbor, works up the road, uh, so just quite near. Uh, you could go and speak to her. So him and Courtney came and um, I didn't know who they were, and they said they would like. He said he would like a, an album, and he, he loved the music and everything, and uh, and that was it. I didn't know who they were, and only afterwards, when I went mm -hmm. to the shop a few days later, um, Judy said something. Uh, the, 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 the Nirvana were play, the, were playing on on mm -hmm. uh, in the shop, I mean the record, and I said, oh, who is this? And because uh, it sounded interesting to me, and she said, oh, it's them, you know. I said, them who? Uh, he went to the shop mm. to speak to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole thing, our, our, our raincoat's life restarted because of mm. that. Because Kurt, who was famous, was interested. So the whole mm. world suddenly thought, oh yeah, there's something in here. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, yeah. Well, we were talking with Rough Trade to re-release the albums anyway, and we, mm. we, we were going to do that, but then they were re-released in America as well in, uh, with Geffen Records. And, mm. uh, and then the whole thing about Riot Girl came at the same time, and um, it's just uh, it's revived mm -hmm. everything that, um, that we had done. It felt like it had been worth it, because I just thought mm -hmm. nobody knew who we were anymore and uh, weren't interested in him, didn't listen to our records anymore. And well, there was all this stuff happening with younger people and they were listening to, mm -hmm. to some of our songs and copying on to cassettes and giving each other uh, mixtapes yeah, yeah. of uh, all sorts of stuff, including our stuff. Yeah. And Kurt Cobain, in the liner notes on Incesticide, talks about listening to the raincoats being like being in um, being 
in the dark in their attic, kind of having broken into their house. He does, doesn't use those exact words, but it's a very striking image. Um, and, of, and it really sums up, I think, the way you offer a kind of open, truthful, direct experience or expression of yourselves to the audience. But at the same time, that's an assertion rather than an invitation. It's actually saying, yeah, this is who I am, but just stay there rather than this is who I am and you can have me. Um, and I think that was one of, one of the reasons that the power of your music has remained so identifiable to people looking to create their own edges, really. Would, would, does that make any sense to you? <laughs> It's your, it's your view uh, of it. <laughs> it's very tactful. <laughs> and it's a very interesting view. Um, we, but it's true, we didn't sort of personally. We I mean, you, it's not something you'd consciously construct. It's like the audience's experience, really. Uh, it's, it's yeah. th th the thing is, we, we, we don't sort of offer our private no. life to the, to the world. It's all about the, the work and the raincoats. It's not about who's doing what outside mm -hmm. of that and who it's just that that's that's what it's important and maybe that shows i don't know well, well i think it's uh, it, it's uh, the songs are written and perhaps played and performed from a female perspective and i think that there's a kind of there's a slightly different perhaps um way of um putting putting ideas across and music across that that is perhaps to some extent more personal even if not all the lyrics are highly highly personal there's a kind of a, a perspective which comes from a, a, a female experience and i think that perhaps is something that um he was drawn to uh, and at the same time uh when we perform we are um i suppose to some extent quite introverted really we we, we don't kind of um uh <laughs> you know, put on a, a, a show show. We, we, we let people come and see us making our work, if you like. And, and, and so there's a, kind of, there's a kind of, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. <laughs> but we're not like, yeah. I, 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 I don't know anymore. So it is like yeah. we've, we've, we've exactly walked into your house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's exactly yeah. like that. I also feel sometimes that when we're playing, uh, this is not, self-conscious i just thought about this recently that when we're playing it's a bit like being in an, in a front room in a living room mm -hmm. uh, we're just there dealing with things making mistakes making mistakes and mm -hmm. discussing things and uh, mm -hmm. I, I suppose because we feel more comfortable now and less nervous about being on stage i used to get quite nervous and now i i don't mm -hmm. and so you just feel relaxed and it's just a kind of relaxing experience together with the with the public i suppose and does that encourage you to take more risks we always take risks i, I always feel like we we're, we're walking on a tightrope and uh, and it can really go <laughs> one way or the other it's... maybe hopefully go on the tightrope but we do fall yeah. <laughs> um, just to ask you a little bit now about your relationship with Rough Trade, because all three of you at different points worked for Rough Trade. Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> I think it was, it was late 78 and I just chucked in my job and um, I was standing on the corner of um, Goldbourne Road and Steve Montgomery came by in a van and... Um, and stopped the van and said, uh, Shirley, have you got a driving license? I said, yeah. And he said, get in. <laughs> and, um, and that's how I started working there. And I, I <laughs> basically, I think Austin was coming, um, coming to work there. So for a month, I drove around selling uh, rough trade records and uh, lots of independent records out, out of the back of this van. And it was really exciting. Like all the, you know, I remember, <laughs> I think in the second week, Teenage Kicks came out, and I was sort of, you know, driving around to, well, even HMV, actually. They bought a few, bought a few more later on when it sort of came out on a major. But, um, 
uh, and that, that, that's how I started working there. And then I started working with Pete Wormsley um, in the record company, doing record production. Um, I think, I don't know, I think I was about the eighth person there. There, there weren't many people there at all. And, uh, and really, many of us didn't really know what we were doing. It was a real steep learning curve. And, but we all had passion, loads of passion, motivation, belief. And we really sort of loved the music. You know, it was really, it was really something very special um, uh, working there. And, um, yeah, so that's how, I, that's how my sort of relationship began there. And, um, and one thing I really want to say is that in praise of Jeff, actually... Um, okay, Jeff be quiet at the back, because we're, <laughs> pra we're praising Jeff now. Yeah, so I, I really want to... Tell them to pipe down over there. <laughs> I really do want to praise Jeff because I think Jeff was a real feminist. I mean, there's no question about it. He was really sort of passionate about having um, women working in that environment. And, um, you know, when I was there, I remember um, Sue Johnson was a director uh, of, uh, of the company. Sue Dunn, who I know is here tonight, Pete's sister, she ran Mail Order. There was Jude, who was m managing the shop. Um, um, Anne Clark, um, she ran the music publishing uh, company. And then they asked me to start a booking agency there. So, you know, it was... It, it was um, I just wanted to ma mention that in view of, you know, in International Women's Day and so, so on. But I think that is something I know that continues. Am I right, Neela? I think, I think, you know, I think this is, this is something that's, um, yeah. So for me, that was really, really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Anything you'd like to say about the shop? Um, yes, just, I used to go into the shop. It was this amazing place to go on Saturdays, as Shelley said. And I, I just felt at home there. And then sh Jeff asked me to work in the shop and I really looked up to them, to the, to, the people there and and uh, and the shop itself. So for me, it was a, a big honor. Or um, I was so happy about it. Yeah. I mean, actually, Rough Trade have, has given me uh, given me a lot of happiness. That was the first thing. Yeah. Then um, the the second thing. Well, I met Shirley through through oh, <laughs> Rough yeah. Trade, um, but also uh, the fact that we were asked to do a single there was. For me, that was really uh, put a stamp on what we were doing a single, and I remember so That's well. That's fairy tale in the supermarket. The fairy tale, yeah. yeah, and in love and adventures close to home. Yeah. The EP, uh, sorry, yeah. and um, I just remember uh, somebody calling. I don't know if it was Shirley calling and saying, "Oh, yeah. your the singles are in," yeah. and I walked towards our trade, and I was crying because I was just so happy <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm about to do that again yes. <laughs> and then and then when the album came out that was really really sealed it and I just felt so 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 happy about it mm. and um, yeah sort of that's funny because Anna didn't tell the best bit of that story was the best bit, was <laughs> Jeff Jeff asked Anna to work in oh, the yes. shop because yeah. he thought that um, yes Yes, he thought it was important to have a woman in the shop so that the boys that came to the shop would learn how to speak to a woman <laughs> and to relate to a woman, <laughs> to engage with a woman, you know. Are you boys, like do you know now <laughs> to how to talk to a woman? How to talk to a woman about music and how to let a woman talk to you yeah. about music. That's, That's what I would say. Yes. <laughs> um, now, you've started your own record label, yeah? yeah. Yeah. Um, Why did you do that? <laughs> well, well, for a start, it makes kind of financial se sense no, in I, a way. I know? think the thing is that, uh, <laughs> you know, we've always, there's always been this ethos of DIY, you know, and it's do it yourself. And, uh, um, and I think that sometimes it's really good to take the bull by the horns and actually do it yourself. And uh, it was something we wanted to experience and uh, I did it uh, with with the hangovers and I had a tiny you know one release tiny um, uh, record label and it was it was fantastic fun and and very hard work so it makes you appreciate an awful lot of things about record labels as well as I'll hand you over to show yeah <laughs> yeah so um, it got to that 
point again where, you know, the, the first album, it was I, actually, I think it was the 30th anniversary of that coming out, and it just seemed really crazy f to do it somewhere else. So, so we did our own label called We Three, and um, um, yeah, we've, we've re released the first album and also Oddy Shape, and probably will release other things, but also it's been a bit of a sort of core for the three of us to, to think about other projects as well mm. now, you know. So, um, for example, I suppose that whole thing of doing, doing shows, doing gigs and so on, sometimes that can be a boring situation. I mean, I don't mean that. In a, it's not. I mean, they love it. <laughs> they absolutely <laughs> they love, love it. it. It's <laughs> true. But to do something slightly more interesting, where you, you know, you've got an opportunity to show, say, Gina's paintings, Gina's films, Anna's drawings, my photographs, stuff like that. So we've been doing, I think, since probably 2009, really sort of picking and choosing the kind of um, events and uh, performances and collaborations and you know uh last last week um we did a cab collaboration with a dancer choreographer um gabby agis um which was which was kind of strange but amazing at the same time and we've got a couple more of those things coming up um going to do something in the summer at the photographer's gallery and then um in the autumn there's a series of collaborations um, coming coming up called Rough Trade Collaborates. Am I I'm, can say that? Can I say a few things about who's doing it? All right, I will. Um, yeah, which is really, really interesting that, that Ben and Nina are, are sort of talking to us about. And what's really great about this is it's, you know, some, some bands from Rough Trade's past, like The Raincoats, Scritti Politti, Pop Group, Cabaret Voltaire, Chris and Cozy, but making collaborations with, with contemporary artists from now, like um, Sleaford Mods, um, Hot Ship. I'm kind of looking at you and... Oh, yeah. And, yeah, we're doing one that we can't mention her name because she's doing a new solo album and, you know, stuff like that. But <laughs> she's amazing. Um, <laughs> She's an angel. Anyway, I won't say any more about it. So the relationship with Rough Trade is going forward into a whole new Absolutely, phase. absolutely, yeah, yeah, which, yeah, which I think is wonderful. And, you know, obviously um, uh, this thing with the, with, with the journal has, has, has been really exciting. It's fantastic, you know, to see so many people here tonight to celebrate, you know, the 40th anniversary of Rough Trade. It's something, um, you know, really close to our heart. Well, on that note, why don't we join the people at the back and start celebrating? Um, please join me, though. Oh, uh, do you want to take questions? No. Well, you can. You can ask them. Que they're very, very nice. You can ask them questions when they're down there. Um, but it's been a great honour and pleasure for me. I last saw you about thirty years ago, and I was at the back somewhere. Um, but uh, please join me very much in thanking the raincoats for taking part in this celebration tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Robert Rubbish of, uh, let's do it that again. Hello, I'm Robert Rubbish, oh, oh sorry, you. Hello, I'm Robert Rubbish of the Lagan. Of the Lagan? Wait, I'll do this again. I'm starting to fluff. <laughs>